Welcome everyone to this afternoon's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we will be focusing on a new book by Conrad Jarausch, Embattled Europe, A Progressive Alternative, published by Princeton University Press in late September. And joining us this afternoon are two discussants, Lisbeth Hoga of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and Mary Noland of New York University. I'm Eric Arneson from George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, along with my longtime colleague and collaborator, Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson Center. The Washington History Seminar is a joint venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly in pre-COVID times in person at the Wilson Center. Uh, and since pandemic restrictions, well, here in the virtual realm. And with this session today, we launched the winter spring 2022 season of the program with about 20, uh, excuse me, 17 sessions on our calendar from today through late May. Behind the scenes are two people who continue to make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. And I'd like to thank our institutional supporters, the George Washington University Department of History, as well as a number of anonymous individual donors who, as we say every single week, we invite you to join their ranks. On the logistics front, please note today's session is again being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you uh, with questions to use the raise hand function. That's our preferred method. That way we get to hear you ask your question, uh, or you can use the Q&A function on Zoom, but we ask that you not use the chat function uh, to communicate your questions. And we will call on as many folks as we can. And with that, I turn the seminar over to Christian Osterman, who will be moderating today's session. Christian, welcome. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, delighted to um, moderate today's session and uh, to first introduce one of uh, this country's and Europe's, really internationally, one of the leading scholars of Germany and Europe, Konrad Jarosch, uh, friend and colleague, just a very pleased to have you with us here today. Uh, professor Konrad Jarosch is the Lursi Professor of European Civilization at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill and a senior fellow of the Zentrum für Zeithistorische Forschung, Center for Contemporary uh, History Research in Potsdam, Germany. Among the more than 50, 50 books which he has written or edited, on German and European history, our reluctant accomplice, um, Wehrmacht Soldiers' Letters from the Eastern Front, published by Princeton in 2011, Out of Ashes, A New History of Europe in the 20th Century, published by Princeton uh, in 2015, a book he wrote at least in part as a distinguished scholar at the Wilson Center, we're proud to say, and Broken Lives, How Ordinary Germans Experienced the 20th Century published by Princeton in 2018. And so barely three years later, he uh, is joining us with yet another book he's published, the book that he will talk about today, Unbattled Europe, A Progressive Alternative. Conrad, it's wonderful to welcome you to the Washington History Seminar. Congratulations, and the Zoom room is all yours. Dear Eric and dear Christian, Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Even if only per Zoom, it feels good to be back at the Wilson Center with its unique blend of academic analysis and policy advice. I am therefore grateful also to the two commentators, Professors Hoge and Professors Noland, and I'm looking forward to their remarks. It is somewhat ironic that as a young man, as an immigrant historian, I was strongly infatuated with the United States. And as an elderly scholar, I am now extolling some of the benefits of the continent of my birth. Let me get started. Is Europe on the verge of collapsing? This negative perception of imminent decline informs much of the media reporting and academic commentary on the old continent. In 
during the last election in the US and the UK, the populist right led by Donald Trump and Boris Johnson has engaged in vicious Euro bashing, making Europe quote unquote, a dirty word. Their ill-informed attacks have conjured up threatening visions of socialist collectivism, unfair trade rivalry, and freeloading in defense. At the same time, leftist Europhile intellectuals like Ivan Krastev have produced an opposite doom and gloom literature that berates the European Union for failing to meet its own integration objectives while complaining about its quote, democratic deficit, unquote. The result of this double attack is a rather warped image of the old continent as a museum of the past that is bumbling in the present and can't get his act together in the future. Seeking to correct these partisan distortions, my recent book, Embattled Europe, in a way continues my 20th century synthesis out of ashes with a history of the present that charts the development of the continent during the last three decades. On the one hand, the text seeks to provide a basic narrative of milestones of European development since 1989. On the other hand, it also presents the thesis that Europe has not only survived, but rather developed a progressive socio-political model from which even the United States could learn so as to reform its own system. In order to exemplify the polyvocality of the continent, each of the chapters begins with a different local vignette, proceeds to a broader case study and thematic comparison and concludes with some comments on the human impact in order to sketch the outlines of what I call a European model. Let me begin with a few words about the resilience of Europe. My narrative starts with the so-called peaceful revolution in which the prospects of Europe look bright and hopeful. It recalls that the overthrow of communism in the East ended the Cold War, made the Red Army withdraw leading to the implosion of the Soviet Union. This repudiation of communism remapped Europe by liberating the satellite states and even imploding the Soviet Union. This surprising fall of the wall inspired optimistic assessments of the future in a whole spate of books like Jeremy Rifkin's The European Dream. I go on to describe that the lifting of the Iron Curtain initiated a post-communist transition to capitalism and democracy that has been explored by a social scientific transformation literature. Even if these travails of the plane turned out to be frustrating, the life chances for East European citizens improved dramatically. At the same time, the process of European integration picked up speed and eventually included most of Eastern Europe and NATO and the EU. After half a century of cold warfare, it seemed that the reunification of the continent finally offered all Europeans, except for the Balkans, a chance to live in peace, freedom, and prosperity. Just when everything seemed to be going so well, the book recalls that an avalanche of crises descended upon the old continent that threw the viability of the EU into doubt by highlighting some of its unresolved problems. Starting with the default of the Lehman Brothers, the sovereign debt debacle spilled over to Europe through the collapse of financial lending, endangering the solvency of headedly indebted Mediterranean countries, making it more difficult for the East Europeans to catch up to the West and threatening the very survival of the Euro as transnational currency. Since the struggle over austerity severely strained the cohesion of the EU, 
the conservative media had a field day with the so-called Euro crisis. I then continue to state that a few years later, a tidal wave of desperate African and Near Eastern refugees washed up on the continental shores, straining the European capacity and willingness to help. The arrival of desperate Black or Muslim refugees awakened fears of losing cultural identity while exaggerated claims of terrorism sparked widespread xenophobic resentment. Finally, the shocking exit of the previously ambivalent United Kingdom from the EU after a contested referendum weakened the U European Union by demonstrating the resurgence of nationalism. Taking together these crises seem to prove conservative Euroskeptics like Douglas Murray right when they took pleasure in announcing, quote, the strange death of Europe. In contrast to such predictions of doom, my book claims that Europe is still functioning quite well, in some respects, perhaps even better than the US. Most Europeans can enjoy high-speed train service, low-cost education, long vacations, and so on, while many Americans are stuck in traffic jams, have to pay high college tuition and work lengthy hours. Contrary to neoliberal complaints, social market economies like Germans remain highly competitive in medium high technology and have a high, huge trade surplus. It seems somewhat contradictory for the Wall Street Journal to berate continental countries for their slower growth while complaining at the same time about their export success. Similarly, I try to show that Scandinavian states like Sweden also reinvigorated the welfare system, including ample childcare that creates more equal opportunities for those disadvantaged by social class and gender. In contrast to Republican denials of global warmings, some countries like Denmark have abandoned nuclear power and switched almost exclusively to renewable energy. A key project of the EU led by Ursula von der Leyen is the so-called Green Deal that promises to reduce carbon emissions. Indicators such as lower homicide rates or higher life expectancy suggests that the post-war relationship between Americans as teachers and Europeans as pupils might be starting to reverse. The final chapters demonstrate that the liberal democracies on both sides of the Atlantic are confronted by unprecedented global challenges which they can only master if they once again work more closely together. Hamstrung by an unpredictable ex-president, American leadership had been faltering and losing its moral legitimacy due to courting dictatorial regimes. At the same time, the Europeans have not always overcome their national divisions either with resolute action. The Russian annexation of Crimea and occupation of Eastern Ukraine as well as President Putin's continual military posturing have revived the need for NATO, though its mission remains unclear in the post-Cold War environment. The text then explores the ugly rise of populism which threatens democratic self-government on both sides of the Atlantic, pushing politics to right-wing extremism and establishing illiberal regimes in the Visegrad countries. A whole new literature is now predicting the imminent collapse of democracy. Finally, Europe's role in the world remains unclear since the transatlantic relationship has moved closer to divorce while the rise of China is upsetting the international order. The EU and the US ought to put aside their quarrels and seize the opportunity for a reset of relations in order jointly to address such global problems. Now, let me add a few more sentences about the European novel uh, model. 
this narrative proposes a thesis that during the last generation, the Europeans have developed their own model that provides a progressive alternative to the American way of life. As I have argued in Out of Ashes, this is a form of democratic modernity produced by painful learning from the catastrophes of the first half of the 20th century. During the stalemate of World War I, three competing visions emerged to battle for supremacy on the continent. In Russia, Lenin propagated a radical form of socialism by promising an egalitarian life in the Soviet Union. From the United States, President Woodrow Wilson promoted peace and prosperity to a benign form of liberal democracy. And in Central Europe, nationalist resentments inspired Mussolini and Hitler to develop a fascism that claimed to create a people's community. In the bitter contest between these ideological blueprints of social engineering, democracy finally emerged victorious since the United States twice rescued the continent from itself. But during the last decades of the 20th century, the Europeans have begun to emancipate themselves from such American tutelage, developing their own version of self-government, international cooperation and social solidarity out of the shared Western values that might serve as an example even for some people in the United States. I argue that the first positive trait of the European model is the existence of a truly democratic election system that seeks to encourage more citizens' involvement. In contrast to the voter suppression, rural overrepresentation and flagrant gerrymandering of the American and to a degree also British winner take all process, proportional representation more accurately reflects the wishes of the electorate by counting all ballots equally, even those of the smaller parties. Europeans have difficulty understanding the American one man, one vote, why that should be so difficult to implement in practice. Since proportional representation is more modern than the 18th century constitution, of the US, it more accurately reflects minority views, which also leads to a higher participation during elections. Weighing each vote more fairly than the Electoral College, this system also used in the European Parliament makes for more representative government in the long run. I also claim that a second exemplary aspect is the generally peaceful international behavior of Europe that has learned the lessons of two incredibly bloody world wars. While individual countries still cling to natural, national sovereignty, their cooperation in the EU is an attempt to avoid the repetition of earlier bloodshed by pooling their efforts in economics and other areas. Though often disagreeing, on foreign and security issues, Brussels speaks with a more united voice in matters of global trade, favoring a balance between free exchanges and protection of its own market. In contrast, since the end of the Cold War, the American government has engaged in unilateralism and the use of force. The European member states are also heavily involved in international organizations supporting the US-inspired liberal world order that emerged after World War II. With the exception of the wars of Yugoslav succession, this multilateral and civilian approach has pacified Europe and helped to reduce tensions in other crisis regions even if occasionally it had to be supplemented by force. Moreover, I believe that a third worthwhile characteristic of the European model is a reformed welfare state, which creates a sense of security and solidarity. Since neoliberals in the UK prevented 
the Europeanization of social policy, it has largely remained a preserve of the member states. No doubt, the rapid expansion of social benefits during the post-war boom ceased during stagflation and deindustrialization after the oil shocks. Instead, following the American example of a middle-class tax revolt, the return to a market ideology has led to a considerable retrenchment in government services. But far from disappearing, the welfare state has been reformed, moving from subsidizing wage replacements for client groups to enabling recipients to re-enter the job market through additional training and childcare. Though strained by feminist demands for equality, immigration pressures and aging populations, the support for government social policy has continued, absorbing almost half of the budget of most European states. In international comparisons of social inequality, EU members therefore perform considerably better than the more polarized US. Finally, I conclude that these traits of the European model constitute a progressive alternative because they provide a better quality of life for most citizens than the wanted American dream. In truth, the latter offers higher income, bigger houses, grander SUVs, but these are purchased by job insecurity, social inequality, racist violence, and a rampant pandemic. People who have lived in Europe prize its social safety net, such as, quote, access for all to childcare, medical and parental leave from work, tuition-free college, a living stipend, universal health care, and generous pensions, unquote. Such benefits unquestionably do require paying higher taxes, but they also provide greater services that make life more agreeable for the average citizen. Many Americans seem not to understand that they get what they pay for in public goods when they complain about bad roads, but to refuse to be taxed for repaying, repairing them. While they would have to develop their own version of these advantages, many Americans might enjoy them as well, if only they knew about them. In a recent social progress index, the United States has therefore dropped down to number 28 in the world, a scandalous decline. Now just a couple more sentences in conclusion. The European experience during the last generation therefore suggests a compelling lesson for the polarized and chaotic climate of Anglo-American politics. Far from collapsing, Europe has not only survived, but rather emerged as an attractive alternative for progressive politics. Though Europeans also suffer from the pandemic and face problems of racial prejudice, Europe has shown a surprising resilience in the face of multiple crises, contradicting facile predictions of doom. Even the illiberal leaders of Hungary or Poland are not seriously thinking of leaving the EU because they are dependent upon its large financial transfers. Though Brussels often seems to be merely, quote, failing forward, unquote, its responses to the recent challenges have shown that European citizens would have much to lose if the EU were to collapse. While the American way of life has many positive features that have attracted generations of immigrants like myself, in recent years, the European model has developed into a serious alternative for progressive politics. No doubt the material rewards for individual initiative are greater in the US, reinforcing the rags to riches myth and the efforts to live with ethnic diversity are laudable. But American politics have become highly polarized. The use of military force has failed to win the peace 
and social inequality has steadily grown. In contrast, Europeans have developed a more democratic self-government, more peaceful international relations, and more social solidarity with those less fortunate. In some aspects of public li of life, as such, such as public transit, health insurance, childcare, and environmental protection, most Europeans are better off than their Anglo-American relatives. Has not the time come for the transatlantic cousins to once again learn from each other? Thank you. Thank you, Konrad. Um, a lot of uh, ground uh, that was covered, and I think uh, 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 we'll have a spirited discussion here. I certainly hope so this afternoon um, with our uh, commentators and also with our uh, sizable audience. Before I introduce our two commentators, uh, let me remind our audience uh, of the uh, three ways um, in which you can participate in this discussion. Um, our preference is for you to use the raise hand function and to be queued for um, uh, your intervention. We'll call on you to unmute yourself and then you can pose your question directly to the panelists. You could also use the Q&A um, uh, function uh, in the Zoom um, room uh, and post your question and uh, I will uh, post it in turn to our panelists. Please do not use the chat function uh, in Zoom. Um, and uh, if you're following us on Facebook Live, uh, feel free to email your question to Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org. You can start getting in line now. Um, with that, um, I'm very pleased to introduce our two uh, distinguished commentators. Let me uh, introduce them and then turn the Zoom room over to them. Our first uh, commentator is Lisbeth Hoag. Uh, she's the W.R. Keenan Distinguished Professor of Political Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and Research Professor at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute in Florence, from where she is reaching us tonight. She was born and educated in Belgium, uh, taught at the University of Toronto uh, 94 to 2000, then moved to Chapel Hill in 2000. She's the author of Multi-Level Governance and European Integration, Oxford 2001, the European Commission of the 21st Century, Oxford 2013, and A Theory of International Organization, Oxford 2019. In her current research, funded by a European Research Grant, she seeks to shed comparative light on, a, on political polarization in Europe and the United States. Our second distinguished commentator is Professor Mary Nolan, Professor of History Emerita at New York University, well known also to many uh, in the field of European German history. She received her PhD from Columbia University. Um, she's the author of Visions of Modernity, American Business and the Modernization of Germany, published in 1994, and The Transatlantic Century, Europe and America, 1890 to 2010. She's the co-editor of Crimes of War, Guilt and Denial in the 20th Century, published in 2002, and of the Routledge Handbook of the Global Sixties, published uh, in 2018. A warm welcome to, the, to both of you. Uh, welcome to the Washington History Seminar. I think we'll go with Lisbeth uh, first, since uh, it's uh, already late, uh, late evening for her. So, uh, Professor Hope, uh, um, you have the Zoom room and feel free to engage Conrad with questions at the end of your uh, comments and then we'll, then we'll shift to Mary. Um, Zoom room is all yours. Thank you, uh, Christian. And it's a real pleasure to be here. I actually have a, a PowerPoint, which I'm going to try to share now. And I hope this works for you all. Let's see. There, can you see this? Yes. See the PowerPoint and you don't see my notes. <laughs> yes. 
Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, so it, it's a real a great honor and pleasure to, to comment on, on uh, Konrad Jaurosch's new book, Embattled Europe, A Progressive Alternative. And here I thought I'd just show the cover because it, I think it's actually quite elegant. Now, I'm, I feel a little bit um, unusual in this company. I'm a political scientist in a forum for contemporary historians, at least to a large extent. Though I think I have one leg up on most people in the audience, perhaps all, but maybe a few others. I've been a colleague of Conrad uh, and a fellow Europeanist at Chapel Hill for nearly 25 years. And I'd like to begin with three observations on Conrad as scholar and colleague before I move to my commentary on the book. Conrad is an astute observer of contemporary Europe and, and that wisdom flows, I think, from uh, a disciplinary mind that seeks to understand historical events in context. And that context can be personal, ordinary people's experiences that shine a light on general currents, or the context can be spatial, examining Europe, for example, through a transatlantic lens. And this book combines both perspective. Um, another thing I've I've discovered from Conrad is that he's a strong proponent of European studies at US universities. And that is nowadays not necessarily an, an easy position to take. He founded the Center for European Studies at Chapel Hill and through his relentless commitment, helped it to grow in a leading place for critical and in this interdisciplinary study of Europe. And I, I've, I've, I'm, I'm very happy to have been and to continue to be part of that group. And finally, Conrad believes in Europe, in the great experiment of European integration that was very clear from his introductory remarks, which have, uh, in his view, and I share that view, um, have been beneficial for peace, prosperity, and e equity in Europe, and which hold promise as a model to emulate. So history and context, which is really the approach that Conrad takes in this book and in much of his work, the value of European studies, the promise of Europe, are I think three motivations um, that uh, run through this book. So let me now briefly recap the argument, um, highlight some strengths of the book in my view, and conclude with a reflection. Um, each one gets one slide from me and then I have a concluding slide. The book opens with a vignette, or actually a double vignette. Um, on the one hand, Emmanuel Macron, in a speech at the Sorbonne, who lays out, and I quote, a compelling vision for the European future, unquote, that has the European Union at its core. And this is then contrasted in the next paragraph with Eurosceptics from Le Pen to Orban to Boris Johnson. I couldn't find a picture with, of Johnson together with Orban and Le Pen. So you get here Twilders there from the Netherlands, but it's the same kind of lot for whom Europe is a dirty word, quote unquote. So this sets up the European puzzle. How can Europe be both promise and burden? How can it be both the future and passé Europe as Jane is faced. And so the book brings out this two-sidedness in an effort to assess which of these faces is more compelling. Uh, for Conrad, it's, it's pretty much clear from the start and he's very bold and clear about this. But what's um, I think very um, appealing in the book is how chapter by chapter, as he also summarized in his introductory remarks, he, he um, lets both sides uh, speak and, and bring forward the facts uh, for their so-called case. There's a second theme, theme that's infusing the book and I call it the American puzzle. What if America falters? Who could be the guardian of liberal democracy and could Europe step into the breach? And this gives the book an imminent input for anyone concerned with American democracy. And that concern is not confined to people living or in, in the United States at this point. So, and I want to move on to, um, I call it the highlights of, you know, really, um, I think important, um, just important elements of the book that um, reasons for why I would recommend the book. And I just limit it to four. The book carves up the argument in 12 thematic chapters 
And each chapter can be read as uh, on itself, as standalone. Yet each chapter is also a piece in the European puzzle or a piece in the way of solving the European puzzle. So this really serves the purpose of unpeeling the Janus-faced character of Europe. Each theme is situated in historical context and Conrad displays a mastery of the details and the major currents and the invisible connections between details and major, major currents. Take, for example, the chapter on migration. This begins with the collapse of a boat with 500 refugees off the coast of Lampedusa, an Italian island. By the way, 345 people died to set the stage for an account of Europe's long-standing ambivalence to large-scale migration. And then it shifts to Italy's own tragedy after 1945, something I wasn't familiar with, when it failed to repatriate many of its own citizens from its former empire, including thousands from Albania, many of whom returned only after the end of the Cold War. Yes, after the end of the Cold War. 1990. And they were then followed by tens of thousands of Albanians in search of a better future outside their own country. Delayed repatriation, unexpected guests. It pits Italy's own against the other. It, it sheds a light, a piercing light, on ambivalence vis-a-vis -vis migration. Connections at first invisible become visible. The writing is engaging, delightful, sometimes surprising. There's a lightness that is incredibly appealing and makes this really a good read for a quite a deep book. Taking the reader on location is a big part of this. And sometimes that can be hard to read, like Lampedusa, because Conrad transports the reader right in the drama. But other times it's cheekily funny, such as his depiction of Brexiteer Jacob Rees-Mogg, who likened Brexit to the Glorious Revolution and celebrated both Brexit and the Glorious Revolution as the great liberations. But as Conrad adds a dead pan, Jacob forgot that the Glorious Revolution brought a Dutch king to the throne, a curious sort of liberation. Um, and finally, the message. This is an uplifting book, uh, consciously so, and I have more to say about that, but without uh, losing sight of the analytical perspective. This is my last substantive slide. And let me just go straight to the conclusion. And I can be very brief because Conrad um, uh, laid it out very clearly in his remarks. Um, the book concludes that Europe's liberal democracy is progressive and resilient. Progressive because it's founded on, on the three properties that Conrad explained, a fairer electoral system, a peaceful multilateralism, and a more developed welfare state. And note the, uh, the transatlantic contrast, which is more implicit than explicit in the book, but was explicit in Conrad's comments. The Euro model, European model has resilience because it's sustained in daily practices, and reinforced by EU institutions and also on balance has been reasonably effective in handling the challenges of the day. That's the verdict. So Conrad sides unambiguously with Macron against the Eurosceptics and he commends Europe over the United States as the more resilient liberal democracy. I think if I had read this book a year ago or a year and a half ago, I probably would have been more critical and uh, critical of the optimistic tone. I think reading it now, um, I find it remarkably foresighted or perhaps Conrad, you were lucky in the sense that um, the book was written and published before and to some extent published, but certainly written before two critical uh, new facts, perhaps turning points. One is on the balance of Europe. And it concerns Europe's response to the pandemic, which has um, surprised many of, of the close observers, including this one now speaking. That is the capacity of Europe to stepping up to the major challenge, um, the core of which are most celebrated, perhaps the 70, 50 billion out of budget recovery funds 
the preservation of the single market, which was on the verge of collapsing, the preservation of common borders, the joint vaccine purchase program and rollout, yes, delayed, but ultimately more successful than uh, in the United States. It was an example of solidarity in practice, precisely the kind of model that Conrad was uh, sketching or is sketching in the book. The second fact is our fact here in the United States. It's America's response to Trump's electoral, electoral defeat, which has accelerated the erosion of liberal democracy. Uh, and while warnings of a civil war, I think are overdrawn, there's reason for deep concern. Just to give an example from my own research on political polarization, in a survey conducted among Protestant pastors in North Carolina, 35% of those who describe themselves as Republicans are prepared to take the law in their own hands. If you're interested in the exact wording of the statement from our survey, a time will come when patriotic Americans have to take the law into their own hands. And 31% are prepared to use force to preserve the American way of life. The wording, the traditional American way of life is disappearing so fast we may have to use force to save it. These, were, these are Protestant pastors. We also asked those pastors to evaluate the mood in their congregations. And three quarters of them believe that most or about half in their congregation agree with either statement. So your book is even more relevant today than when you wrote it. The question is really whether Europe can consolidate its better governance. And this will depend on two conditions. And I uh, let me just summarize them quickly. First, how it responds to the intense functional pressures for concerted action. There is a long game of climate change and population movement from Africa and Asia Minor. And there's the shorter game of geopolitics, security threats that stem from US decline, rise of China, the Russian menace. How will Europe respond in the vein of as its response to COVID, quick, bold, and solidary? Or like it responded to the Euro crisis or the migration? crisis, hesitant, partial, polarizing. Um, perhaps the strongest precondition for developing stronger state institutions, because that is what Europe, the European model needs, is to face an existential security threat. That's what work on state building, Charles Tilly's work, for example, tells us that's what work on, on the origins of federations, William Riker's work tells us. So, and, and those threats are on the horizon. But there is a second precondition, and that is that the external threat affects all or most countries in the same way. Symmetrical, symmetrical threats are much more likely to induce collaboration. So will these external threats be divisive or will they be unifying? Will they be seen as similar to all or most or will they be seen as a dissimilar? We'll, soon we'll have probably a first test with Russia's menace to the Ukraine. The second um, challenge is that Europe's future will also depend on how it responds to internal heterogeneity. And here, uh, Conrad mentioned it, one source, illiberalism in, in some of the countries, Hungary, Poland, Slovenia. There are signs here of a bolder EU pushback um, in, in, in the most recent months, and I do not have the time to go into detail, but I'm happy to, to expand on this in discussion if, if uh, someone is interested. Because I want to conclude and con close by this quote from Conrad's book, which I, I'll leave you to read, um, but let me just give you the gist. There is much life and future in Europe, not perhaps despite its violent past and current vicious, but perhaps precisely because it's violence past. Europe epitomizes that history does not need to repeat itself if one is willing to learn from history. Um, and that, I think, is the big message from Conrad's book. Thank you for um, letting me read the book and comment. Looking forward to your response. Let me just stop share. Thank you so much, uh, Lisbeth. And I'll now turn to Mary. Uh, the Zoom room is all yours. Oh, or okay. actually, Con uh, Conor, would you like to respond uh, now or do you want to 
wait on, until Mary has given her comments. Have a preference? Just one sentence of okay. thanks for Sorry, Mary. such a, uh, an engagement of the argument because I have also learned a great deal from Lisbeth and from Gary, uh, that is from the European studies people. And I feel sometimes uh, somewhat inept compared with their lifelong work on these issues. But I was trying to get the story out to a larger audience and that meant it had to be presented in a somewhat less technical way. Great, thank you. Now, Mary, over to you, my apologies. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in a discussion of what is an extremely important and interesting book. Um, Professor Yarish has written a vigorous and richly documented defense of the European model, which as he says, and sees as characterized by a truly democratic election system, robust welfare states and peaceful international behavior. These are supported by both institutions and shared values. They offer to Europeans a better way of life than that in the US in many respects and represent a model of democratic modernity from which the US can and should learn. Professor Yarish develops these arguments through a nuanced assessment of the accomplishments in the areas of economy, welfare and social policy, environment, and the transition of Eastern Europe after 1989. His enthusiasm for what Europe stands for and has achieved is accompanied by a clear acknowledgement of the limits uh, or unevenness of these achievements and of the challenges the European model faces from within and from abroad. Foreign debt, sovereign debt and migration crises, populism and the lack of security and defense policies, the United States and China. Embattled Europe occupies a middle position between the much more critical assessments of the European model by authors such as Wolfgang Steich, who sees it as already long since dead, and the rather Panglossian ones of scholars like Yusi Hanamaki in his recent Pax Transatlantica. It offers the kind of complex assessment of the state of Europe of works like Kathleen Thelen's Varieties of Liberalization. Uh, noting similarities and differences, accomplishments and ongoing problems. The book is lucidly, and I think most importantly, very accessibly written. Um, it makes complex arguments in the kind of prose uh, that uh, will be understandable to uh, the general reader. Um, <clears throat> It offers deep dives into telling examples of social welfare or environmental actions or successful economic transitions from communism to capitalism, even as attention is paid to diversity and unevenness across Europe. Embattled Europe is a timely and important work that tries mightily to counter the view that there is no alternative to American neoliberal capitalism, weak social policy, inaction on the climate crisis and interventionist foreign policy. It is an optimistic book about the possibilities for more progressive politics, and we certainly can use some optimism in these rather bleak times. I am very sympathetic to that effort, and were I still teaching, I would definitely assign this book to my students. Yet, much as I would like to share all of the book's optimism, I am not entirely convinced that aspects of it are fully justified. Let me raise three concerns. The first is about how distinctive the European model and the US one are. The second is about how secure the, cure, secure the European model is across Europe, especially in terms of liberal democracy, the rule of law and human rights. And the third focuses on whether the European approach to international relations has any chance of prevailing, admirable as I find it. Professor Yarsh presents a picture of a Europe that is distinctive on an array of domestic issues, ranging from having more coordinated capitalism, general and universalistic welfare states, robust liberal democracies, and extensive environmental policies. The Atlantic is wide in his telling, and there is a clear, what one might call market gap, climate gap, war gap. Um, I made similar arguments in my 2012, The Transatlantic Century, 
But since then, I have become somewhat more pessimistic and have come to see Europe, including Western Europe and the U.S., as mirroring one another in a variety of domestic developments over the last decade and decade and a half. Yes, European economies accord a more active role to the state, but they have moved in emphatically neoliberal direction since the 1980s. Financialization, privatization, deregulation prevail uh, to varying degrees uh, across Europe and the language of competition and efficiency and global openness uh, <coughs> is spoken everywhere. To be sure, Europe has a less full-throated neoliberalism than the US, but it has substantially, these recent developments have substantially weakened the distinctive European varieties of capitalism that I think were more evident in the last decades of the 20th century uh, than uh, in the first two decades of the 21st. Um, works like Stephanie Mudge's The Left Reinvented Western Parties from Socialism to Neoliberalism is I think instructive here about this sort of it restructuring of uh, the European model. And it raises the question, when does one become or adopt enough neoliberal market-friendly policies to have slipped over from a distinctive variety of capitalism and social policy uh, to something that's more akin to the Anglo-American model? Europe, or at least Western and Northern Europe, have much more developed welfare states than the United States with enviable universal health care and more generous child care benefits. But these social policies have been narrowed in the name of competitiveness and ne necessary austerity. Inequality is increasing, albeit at differential rates across the Euro-American world. There is opposition to multiculturalism and harsher policies toward migrants. Uh, that are more extensive on both sides of the Atlantic as our xenophobic discourses about others, be they longtime and legal uh, <coughs> residents or refugees or the undocumented. Finally, there are similar culture wars that focus on the need for patriotic history education, criticize progressive ideas about women and gender, and seek to regulate reproduction and LGBTQ rights. The Atlantic seems to be narrowing in regrettable ways. The second issue is how widely the European model is shared across Europe and how secure its, its future is. In part, this is a question of economic and social policy unevenness that has persisted. And the book acknowledges this across uh, the three decades since 1989, and it seems likely to continue. 2008 and the policies of the European Commission and European Central Bank only exacerbated these divisions. To be sure, and encouragingly, the response to COVID has been more egalitarian and solidaristic than to the 2008 debt crisis. Nonetheless, the question remains, what does a two-tier two Europe mean for the European model uh, as an alternative uh, and for the stability of its future? How much does the much more prosperous West benefit or perhaps even need a less prosperous East with lower wages and fewer social benefits? Is unevenness temporary or is it going to be permanent? In part, unevenness involves politics. And here the two biggest elephants in the room are of course Poland and Hungary, which have developed distinctly and in their view proudly illiberal forms of democracy, which curtail the independence of the judiciary, limit the press, alter election laws, and curb what can be taught in terms of history and gender studies. The book both acknowledges uh, populism and I think perhaps somewhat downplays the challenges presented by this new form of right radical uh, politics. Um, because the populace really, it seems to me, uh, present very serious uh, challenges to the core values of the European model, such as respect for human rights, the rule of law, gender equality. Can one talk of a European model and have illiberal democracies like Poland and Hungary as part of the EU? Do they and their populist counterparts across Europe not fundamentally challenge uh, the meaning uh, of Europe? the meaning as defined by Professor Yarish, liberal democracy, social solidarity, human rights, and tolerance, among other key values. Right radical populists are only in power uh, in a few countries uh, in uh, the former 
communist East, but they are now a force in every country, uh, often the second or third party in terms of votes. They have kind of shifted politics and political discourse to the right. The big upsurge in right radical populism after 2015 has leveled off, but populism uh, is uh, not by any means disappearing. Many populists have a quite different definition of what it means to be Europe. European, what the European model uh, stands for. Uh, they focus uh, on nationalism, ethnic homogeneity, Christianity, welfare chauvinism, i.e. limiting social policy to the ethnic majority only, and defense of the West, however ill-defined that concept is. Populists in America share similar views. And the center-right and center-left European parties who designed and promoted the European model have themselves been losing votes over the last few decades. I am more persuaded by Professor Yarish's argument about a distinctive European approach to foreign policy. There is definitely a commitment to multiculturalism, I mean, multi multilateralism, <laughs> to international law and international organizations, to diplomacy, and that stems, uh, as he rightly acknowledges, uh, from the lessons learned by two devastating world wars. But does this European model have a chance of prevailing against the much more unilateralist and interventionist, often militarily interventionist American approach that is concerned above all with maintaining US hegemony more than engaging more constructively with other countries? Take aid to the global South, for example. Yes, as Professor Yarish argues, individual European states and EU institutions have given much more generous development aid as opposed to military aid than the US has. Although the arms trade from Europe is pretty vigorous. Um, but EU development agencies have since the 1980s endorsed the structural adjustment policies favored by the US and by the IMF and World Bank in which the US plays a dominant role. And these have had uh, many detrimental social consequences for the global South or take the current situation with Iran. The European signatories to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, as the Iran nuclear deal is officially called, uh, the European signatories have not withdrawn as the US has, and they resent the secondary sanctions that the US threatens to impose on any European firms that trade <coughs> with Iran. But European signatories have not been able to create a viable alternative to US policies. They've not been able to circumvent the threat of sanctions. They did set up INSEX, the instrument in support of exchange and trade and exchange, sort of barter system that would circumvent uh, the swift international banking system from which Iran has been excluded by the US. But European businesses are too afraid of being shut out of the American market to risk investing in or trading with Iran. Uh, and then there is the current situation with Ukraine. Talks are between the US and Russia and neither the EU nor major European countries are directly at the table. <laughs> Putin and Biden and Blinken talk and then uh, they, uh, <clears throat> the US talks separately to its European allies. Um, Professor Yarish suggests that there has been or might soon be a transatlantic divorce on questions of uh, foreign policy. It seems to me more like what we have is an ongoing unhappy marriage in which the European wife is afraid to leave, fearful of going it uh, alone, and however reluctantly agrees with or submits to the American husband's determination to maintain his empire of bases and sanctions and interventions. These questions and disagreements notwithstanding, I want to emphasize in conclusion that embattled Europe is a very important an interesting and readable and provocative book. And I hope it will be as widely read as it deserves to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Before I give Conrad a chance to respond to uh, both these very thoughtful comments um, by Elizabeth and Mary, let me remind our audience that uh, you're very welcome to join us uh, by uh, using the raise hand function uh, to pose your your um, question or comment to uh, uh, the panelists and or by uh, using the Q&A function uh, to posting your, your uh, question or comment there. Um, with that, um, Conrad, uh, back to you. Um, uh, uh, response to uh, these two comments. Yeah, let me begin with the second uh, comment. 
because there I think the disagreement is more open and clear. Uh, I, I agree that uh, I've been talking about the positive dimensions of the European model more than the negative issues that are bedeviling the Europeans, but the last part of the book talks about them as being similar to American difficulties and the need to cooperate more. Uh, I think, you know, that is not a kind of European uh, didacticism uh, that you might sort of suspect. I think there is a literature, especially Philip Thea uh, on neoliberalism. I think uh, the high point of neoliberalism has passed uh, in Europe. Uh, their election results have the left has started to recover in some countries. After all, the new German government is led by the Social Democrats and has Greens in it. Uh, so I think it, it, the, the high point of the neoliberalism, uh, at least in, in the German speaking countries was uh, in the first decade of the 21st century rather than uh, in the current period. So I think I agree with you, uh, but that um, this neoliberalism was never quite as pronounced on the continent. And I would argue that it is no longer uh, as dynamic as it was before. Then uh, the question of populism, that is still somewhat more up in the air. Um, although in, Czech, in the Czech Republic, uh, the third one of the illiberal leaders has been defeated. There is a Polish election that is coming up and a Hungarian election. And if the opposition gets its act together and unites behind candidates and so on, it is not uh, uh, cast in stone or written in stone or so that the illiberal democracies will uh, continue. Uh, it is an open-ended uh, uh, question. Uh, on the um, last major point, uh, I think uh, I am clear that the United States, of course, is militarily vastly superior, but I would argue for complementarity because American military policy has won wars, but lost the peace. And in the last one in Afghanistan, it's even lost the war. So uh, this is not necessarily something that needs emulating. Obviously, Ukraine is right at the doorstep uh, of the Europeans and uh, their, uh, the use of force or the threat of force is probably um, necessary uh, so that as I'm trying to say that, that these are complementary kind of situations, uh, whether, you know, unhappy marriage stays unhappy and stays married or whether it will lead to divorce, you know, is I think an open question. It is just, the book is, was written uh, initially the draft before the, the victory of Biden and although it may seem uh, excessively arrogant, uh, I wanted to point for the younger generation of Americans who seem to be caught in a kind of populist right-wing never-never land, some examples of not just ideological alternatives, but also of practical politics in some other places, namely in Europe, uh, which could be working so that uh, the younger generation wouldn't, of the Bernie Sanders people, wouldn't just have to flounder about looking for examples, but go to those places where there are examples there and as I was trying to say, they would have to develop their own versions. I am not arguing at all that 
for a simple transatlantic copying, uh, your own work makes it very clear that this simple-minded copying is not what goes on in history, uh, but more sophisticated kind of uh, uh, ways of taking examples and then coming up with your own version. Uh, that I think is uh, is the challenge. And you know, I had already responded a bit to Lisbeth before. So if you don't mind, let me just thank both of you right now for your very helpful comments and let's see what the audience has to do. Thank you. Uh, Lisbeth, you, you had raised your hand uh, there for spring, that was just, okay, by mistake. Well, um, let me, uh, Connor, before we turn to the audience, um, uh, just ask you a question about the methodology. Uh, you're a historian, um, uh, and as has been mentioned, the book has been exhaustively uh, researched in, in many ways um, historically. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, the uh, challenges in writing about very recent history, writing in what one critic said is a sort of quasi-journalistic style, um, writing what... Um, one may call the history of the present. If you could talk a little bit about the challenges as an historian and writing about this very recent past. That of course is uh, something that is highly risky. The German cliche has it, if an ass or a donkey is feeling too well, it goes ice skating, meaning that it is likely either to break through the ice or to fall down <laughs> and get seriously hurt. So, uh, you know, the chance of being wrong is much uh, higher in writing about the recent past or even into the present than it is uh, if you uh, are doing Roman history or medieval studies or something like that. Uh, in the German context, contemporary history has three subdivisions. One of them is the classic one of the Weimar Republic and the Third Reich. That is the Institut für Zeitgeschichte in Munich uh, and so on. Then uh, there is the post-war uh, history, which goes up to 1989-1990, is the usual caesura. That is what we were doing in Potsdam, uh, by and large. But in the meantime, we have three decades and counting. Uh, so it means that we have an entire generation of young people coming uh, into maturity and so on that are no longer uh, born in the, in the period of the war. I'm a child of the war, uh, Kriegskind, as they say in German in 1941. Um, so, I'm still, and my father was born in 1900. So I, I cover physically the entire 20th century. And when one goes into a more recent period, of course, the documentation is rather limited. It's not available. Um, it is not clear how some open questions will finally come out. It may be tomorrow morning in the news another incursion into the U Ukraine. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can probably throw away a part of the chapter on defense. Um, but uh, I think it is also important not just to sort of roll your eyes and throw up your hands and say, oh, I can't say anything intelligent. Much of what we're talking about in these days has historic background and has uh, a depth that Lisbeth uh, alluded to in the Italian case with migration, you know, centuries of Italian outward migration, and then of course the Italians in, uh, in Albania and so on. Uh, and so there is a historic background. And if as a contemporary historian, you look at these things, uh, you are different, you're not really looking for theoretical models uh, like uh, political scientists or sociologists would be, uh, but you're looking for explanations grounded in some understanding of what came before. Uh, 
and I think as a hist historian of the present, um, you know, as I said, the risk is high, but if you can take a running start, as it were, if you can ground your comments into some of the things that precede the last generation, uh, then you also have a chance of seeing things which you wouldn't see if you were a journalist. So thank you. Great. Yes. Thank. Thank you very much. All right. Let's go to um, uh, David Kanan. David Kanan, if you could please unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. And it's very interesting. Um, I, I have not read the books and so can only comment on the presentation. Uh, the whole notion of a European model strikes me as something of a nervous teleology. It's not enough to consider whether the European Union is going to prosper, whether Europe itself is going to prosper, whether Europe is coming together or moving apart. The whole notion of a model suggests that others are going to look to Europe. And I just wonder if it, it just seems to me that it, it, this is a long standing problem where Europhiles insist on, an, on finding a great grand role for Europe in the world, despite having lost that role by destroying themselves in the 20th century. That we once were great and powerful and you had to listen to us. Now we are wise and just and humane, but you still have to listen to us. And it, uh, it, begs, it begs a number of questions, which is first, if uh, this comparison with the Americans, how would Europe, if the, if the American model is model, if you will, the American position is not as attractive or appealing as the Europeans, American responsibilities in the world are very different than the Europeans have taken. Part of Europe's um, prosperity comes from ha not having to do some of the things that the Americans have undertaken militarily in it and, and in other ways. So can Europe really take that up? Or frankly, is Europe more permanently small than it would like to admit? And second, um, is the question really not about the Americans comparing to, to the Europeans, but is the Western model itself under real pressure now, unprecedented pressure? Does our um, rhetoric around neo-enlightenment institutions and supposed values, uh, does it stand up under the criticism now about its imperialist and racist underpinnings? Things that have become much more seriously, it's no longer being criticized from the margins or from say the Marxist ideological wing, now there's much more serious consideration of whether European and American values, Western values and Western power are really worth considering as models for people trying to make the, their ways forward. Um, so my question really is, the, is there a, an unnecessary entanglement or a, or a dysfunctional entanglement where there's an effort to analyze both Europe's ability to function internally and to kind of make its own, get its own act together. And the notion that it has some sort of model that has to be presented to the world uh, so that, that Europe can post, can posture as continuing to be sort of a top tier geostrategic, economic and social actor when for, perhaps it is not. Thank you so much, Kamal. Okay. Uh, I think your comment comes from a neo-realist perspective and from a military uh, and power perspective, uh, which makes sense on some level, uh, but is also rather uh, limited. I think the question of Europe having lost its role, I have in, uh, in Out of Ashes a chapter, actually the 20th century history starts with a chapter on imperialism and I have a chapter on decolonization in there too, in which I try to deal with the changing role of Europe in the world. Uh, it's not the Rome, Greece kind of business. The Europeans are the Greeks and they have culture and the Romans have the empire. Uh, and you know, both of them need to be together. That is a cliche also uh, already a hundred years old and so on. Um, Okay, the Western model is under criticism, but if you look at the entire 20th century, uh, you have communism, you have liberalism, you have fascism, all of these are European creations. And I have yet to see anything in other 
continent which has the same kind of ambition, organizational power, and so on. Uh, and my argument is just that in the course of the century, communism got defeated, fascism got defeated, what is left over is liberal capitalism, but that liberal capitalism in the American style is unilateral. The early 2000s and so on were the high point of the assumption that the United States is the only remaining world power uh, and that Europeans in the 1950s, 60s and 70s Americanized, tried to pick up many American cultural, social patterns, economic patterns and so on. But in the meantime, they have also moved away from some of these things because how America has developed its Western values is one way and the Europeans have developed in a slightly different way. And I'm trying to tease this difference out. And yes, there is a group of Americans which would be European and there's a group of Europeans which would be American. So you have subsets on both sides. You know, so you can't just sort of say, this is American, this is European, and so on. But when push comes to shove, you know, in terms of ultimately making decisions and so on, there is a difference. And I would insist that this difference is worth thinking about instead of just pounding one's own chest and saying, we have the biggest military in the world. Uh, if you continue to keep doing that, I think you will continue to have Iraqs and Afghanistans. And I think this will not help the world at all. Thank you. Um, let's go to Michael Novak. Michael Novak. And Elizabeth and Mary, feel free to chime in at any, any point. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, my question is, you were mentioned earlier, there was some discussion between both Mr. Jarosz and the panelists of the, the, neo, the populist regimes in Poland and Hungary and that potentially posing a threat to the European model. Some scholars, myself included, have characterized these regimes as being pseudo-fascist or neo-fascist. In your opinion, would you think that that's accurate or do you think that comparison is overblown? Thank you. Okay, um, I am not a specialist in Hungarian history. I know a little bit more about Poland. Uh, therefore, you know, this is something where I would tread very carefully. Uh, you know, my, my older son, when I told him to carry out the garbage said to me, you're a fascist. So this fascist accusation you know, is, you know, easily raised. The populist terminology tries to have an intermediary kind of level on that discussion. If you are a journalist, if you are a, an opposition member and so on in, in Poland or in Hungary, you may very well feel that you are in a neo-fascist regime. Uh, I would not go quite as far but as I said, uh, there are other people who know more about it. You may know more about it yourself. Thank you. Um, we'll go next to uh, Glenna Matthews, and then we'll go to um, Martha Chomiak. Glenna? Please unmute yourself. Um, there you go. Yep, you, you had it. You're muted now. My question is about Italy. And um, I'm wondering, I love the vision that uh, we heard about um, why the European model is something to emulate and why it's important to be partners and uh, 
and, and so on, all of which I find very persuasive, I'm wondering, is Italy going to be a good partner? I've been reading very positive accounts of uh, the leadership of Draghi, and it seems to me that so far from, I'm not a specialist, I'm an Americanist, but I'm of Italian descent, so that's my uh, skin in the game. But Italy seems to be in the process of moving away from populism and toward a much better style of governance and, um, you know, a more stable capacity to be uh, European partners. Am I overly optimistic? Thank you. Conrad, and perhaps Lisbeth might chime in too since you're, you're, you're currently based uh, uh, there. Conrad? Uh, I, I hope that the current direction will solidify itself. And because uh, with Britain out of the European Union, Italy is really the third biggest country, import, most important economy, uh, and so on, the leading one among the Mediterranean ones. And in many ways, it's had a kind of frustrating period under Berlusconi. But Lisbeth, please. Yes, if I, if I just may. Um, well, the biggest party um, in Italy right now, according to public opinion polls, is the Brothers of Italy, um, which is a very traditionalist, um, semi-populist, I say semi-populist because it's a very strange kind of party, um, that um, has um, some quasi-authoritarian traits to it, but not in uh, not in the way that we see in Hungary or Poland. So I, I'm just saying this in the sense that, as in several countries, and Conrad um, acknowledges that in the book, and, and Mary has made that very clear, the battle for um, the human rights, liberal values, and liberal democratic values rule of law is very much ongoing. Um, at this point in Italy, um, there is a complicated political game going on in terms of appointing the next uh, president. The president is elected by the parliament, and there is a game between the center-left and the, the right parties, or center-center-right parties. It's possible that Draghi, who is indeed um, ha is the person with the greatest international standing, who's been an effective leader, um, during COVID uh, becomes the president. And then the question is whether that will trigger elections that could possibly bring um, the right back into power. The right would then be led by the party I mentioned, the Brothers of Italy. So I wouldn't say that Italy is safely in the liberal democratic camp. At the same time, I wouldn't put the Brothers of Italy next to Orban or next to the Polish government, the PiS party in, in Poland. Um, there are certainly similarities, but there's also differences there. I think there is a, a greater reluctance to um, violate the key principles of the rule of law. What, what I, um, maybe if I could just add a few more words um, this, this, this battle against the liberalism is very much at the heart of, of and, and is um, at the heart of whether or not the European model, to use Conrad's work, uh, words, um, is actually going to have a chance to consolidate um, in Europe. And that, that, is, that is a struggle. Um, I mentioned at the end of my comments that the, the, there are some hopeful signs in, in, and again, the pandemic pr provided that opportunity. So when the uh, 750 billion package for extra money was, was agreed, the release of the money was made conditional on adhering to the rule of law. Um, and that was clearly targeted at Hungary and Poland. Hungary and Poland were very angry about this, tried to block it, but failed to do it. Um, and then when the commission withheld the first tranche of money, it became clear that the European Commission was serious about the matter. Um, Poland and Hungary then stepped to the European Court of Justice to try to, to challenge the decision, say this is unconstitutional. And in a, a preliminary ruling by the European Advocate General, as kind of an advisor to the European Court of Justice in December, the Advocate General recommended to, 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 um, to drop the, the challenge, which essentially is um, to dismiss the challenge as, as uh, unconstitutional, as, as un inadmissible. Normally, the European Court of Justice simply follows what the Advocate General advises. 
UP Court of Justice will, will hold its judgment in February. If the, court, the UP Court of Justice upholds the Commission's right to withhold funding until certain conditions is missed, um, are, are met, then there is a chance that we begin to see a, a greater kind of um, capacity of the European institutions to tie the hands of potentially illiberal governments. But we'll just have to wait and see. This is what Conrad said. This is looking into the future. We wait for new facts and then see where we take the interpretation from there. Thank you. Um, let me call on Martha Blaszewski um for her intervention. If you could please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. We occasionally have this, this, this issue. There you go. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate the approach that Professor Yaros is taking. And I really look forward and would recommend that the book be translated into Russian and try to be popularized in Russia. That said, I have, um, in a sense, a, a very difficult question to ask. And that is, if the European model is so attractive and if it is so workable, and a country like Ukraine presently is arguing its own European character, would not the inability or unwillingness of Europe to respond more passionately or more actively to the Ukrainian attempt to be European, question the validity of the attractiveness and the viability of the European model. Thank you very much. Um, Conrad? Yeah, well, certainly it is a test case. And the first questioner is right uh, in, in part, but not completely, um, because the Europeans are also talking to the Russian leadership and are engaging Ukraine. And it's been a zigzag history, really, uh, because the Ukrainian population, if I understand it correctly, is split between people who only speak Ukrainian, people who are bilingual, and people who speak uh, by and large uh, Russian and identify themselves ethnically this way. And uh, the last decade, decade and a half, the domestic politics of Ukraine have varied between folks that wanted to get along with Russia uh, better and people who wanted uh, to move Ukraine more towards uh, the EU and the EU uh, being uh, having a certain amount of enlargement fatigue uh, and having enough difficulty with the new East European members or Mediterranean members and so on was perhaps not quick enough in order to support uh, closer ties with Ukraine, but it also has to do with uh, corruption uh, in Ukraine and uh, capturing state institutions for private gain. So this is very complicated. Uh, it's, it's pressures from the outside, from Russia and from the West and so on, uh, on the Ukraine to get it to decide which way it really wants to turn. Uh, in many ways, I think, you know, this is an open-ended question right now. And it's not just a military question, it's also a cultural question of Roman Catholicism on the one hand uh, in the Western parts of Ukraine and uh, Russian Orthodoxy in the Eastern parts of Ukraine. Um, so um, 
Let's hope that we do not have a major military confrontation and let's hope that the uh, indirect, uh, more economic approach and negotiating approach of the Europeans uh, will be successful so that the Ukrainians can figure out where they want to be themselves in the future. Thank you. Unless Lisbeth and Mary, you have any, any further comments, um, I think we'll have to bring, unfortunately, this uh, session to an end. Uh, with apologies to those uh, I could not call upon, uh, with thanks and congratulations to Conrad uh, on his new book, and with profound uh, thanks also to Mary and Elizabeth for really thoughtful, engaging comments. I'm going to turn this back over to Eric. Eric. Thank you, Christian. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our audience in attendance. Um, I would like to invite you all to Rejoin us next Monday on January 31st at 4 p.m. when the Washington History Seminar reconvenes for our second session of the new year, this one focusing on Ada Ferrer's Cuba and American History with discussants Rebecca Scott and Lillian Guerra. Till then, take care, be safe, and good night. Mm -hmm.